You're listening to a Whales Are Whales production. You're also listening to Whales. Visit whalesorwhales.com for more projects and shows like this one. Hello everyone, quick uh, note here before we begin, we are going to be discussing our third act of The Book Thief, which is going to be parts 7 through the end of the book, so make sure you've read that far if you don't want things spoiled. Speaking of having things spoiled, we also spoil big plot points from The Fault in Our Stars and Anne of Green Gables, so read those books because they're both good and you're going to have them spoiled in this episode and we don't typically give very much warning. Uh, With all that said... Um, enjoy the episode, and actually, I have another catchphrase, but I'm going to say that for the end of the episode, so listen to that point. Bye-bye. Hello and welcome to Third Person, a podcast about sharing our love for and conversations about storytelling and fiction. This is season one, where we're each bringing a book to read through, and each book is going to be split into three different episodes. This episode is the third and final episode for our first bit, bic, book, which is from Abigail, The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. And speaking of Abigail, my two co-hosts are here with me once more, one of which is the aforementioned Abigail Abigail Inslee. Hello, Abigail. I've never been mentioned first. It almost makes you butchering my name okay. (laughs) What do you think about the name Abigail? Uh, it's, it's new. I've been called a lot of things in my life. I've been called a lot of versions of the name Abigail. Abigail was never one of them. Have you ever been called Abigailable? No, that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> and joining me today is the less punnable person, my brother and cohort, Stephen. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Brian. Uh, you know what I've noticed? What is that? Um, I don't think Marcus Zusak is pulling the punches anymore. Yeah, um, but before we go into that, I should probably say what my name is. I'm Brian, by the way. Did you call me Brian? I think so. Cool. Well, you covered, uh, you hit two birds with one stone that I just had to kick when I was already down. So. That's, that's good uh, o- opening fiction lines. For right there. <laughs> it's a story prompt. It's all a lot of good information and a good economy of words. Exactly. So you just jumped right into it, which is talking about the actual act three of this book. Um, that's ostensibly what this episode is going to be about anyway. Um, so yeah, let's do that. I'm thinking we'll split this episode into two parts. The first part's going to be talking about the third act of this book and what we thought about it and the second part is just going to be talking about what we thought about the book as a whole kind of just looking back over the whole uh journey and see where we came from for where we were first thinking about it to how we ended up here so how does that sound Steven? oh I, abigail's excited I, yeah i, I had to think about excited. it but woohoo as well <laughs> <laughs> awesome so yeah first thought and it's the same that popped into my mind i kind of retract everything i said from last episode <laughs> yes uh, you retract in... it oh tell me more brian tell me more are you saying you were wrong i'm saying i had incomplete information <laughs> <laughs> you mean yes. called not finishing the book <laughs> yeah <laughs> so if anyone that's the fun of our format we make judgments before we actually know what we're talking about right. it's uh it's great uh, but in the last episode, I was talking about how it felt like the book never had anything really bad happen and kind of just <laughs> did token bad things and always kept everyone safe in the end. It didn't have a real sense of like weight. To and it. at that point, we were still, you know, confidently looking at each other, nodding our heads, saying, oh, man, they're going to they're going to kill off a Liesl's Papa. We know that's going to happen. And that's going <laughs> to be the big thing of the book. It's going to be so predictable. Exactly. But see, um, what was unpredictable about that whole situation was when he died. That's what got me. They yeah. tricked me. They lulled me into a false sense of security because as I was going through Act 3, I was thinking the same thoughts as Brian, and I was like, wow, this is a token book. Everyone's going to be okay except Rudy. We already know he dies, but everyone else is going to be fine. Yeah. Man, I was wrong. <laughs> I think so, we were all pretty wrong. <laughs> what really amazed me is not just that they killed Rudy or not just that they killed um, Liesl's papa, but, but they killed everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like literally everyone except uh, Liesl and the mayor uh, and his wife. Mm-hmm. That's, that's and, pretty and ridiculous. Matt, the one person that we all You're knew right. was going to die lived. Yep. They didn't kill him. The story like, went through the town 
person by person telling you how they died without ever actually saying that they died. Exactly. Yeah. Which, funnily enough, much like the book itself, we're talking about the ending before we talk about any of the stuff leading up to it. But the ending was the best. Kind of funny. The ending was kind of the best. But I'm curious here to, to go back in time a little bit and talk about the events leading up to the ending and what we thought about those. Our discussion for Act 3 starts at the beginning of Part 7. Mm -hmm. And Stephen, do you remember what was going on at the beginning of Part 7? I'm afraid you can't just throw a number at me that I started reading uh, weeks ago. Perhaps you I'm could clarify. I'm curious if you can remember from where we last talked about, but I'll, I'll fill in the blanks. Oh, I'm just curious I think it was, know. I think we were just starting to get to know Max. Mm, no, 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 no. Max is writing his book. Yeah. Those are my I'm, two guesses. <laughs> okay. Okay. Abigail, what is your guess? Um... Oh, haha, ha, I'm a cheater. I just looked at it. <laughs> okay. So what was um, going on at the beginning of part three? Yeah, beginning seven. Beginning of part seven. Oh, sorry, act three. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's confusing. Okay, I'm just reading the little titles here, and this is kind of when um she... Ah, oh, this isn't helping, actually. <laughs> That's when she got the dictionary. That's yes, That's when they started doing the dictionary words. I remember that, but I don't remember... If Max, yeah, Max was still there. Max was still there. Yep. Um, it's right before her papa, or maybe it's right after her papa helped a Jew in the street. I believe it is right before. So Act okay. 3 was really the point where everything bad started happening. Mm -hmm. um, everything really bad. Everything up until that point was, you know, some close kind of token scares, but nothing had real, real consequences. And Act 3, I feel, is when consequences started to actually begin to manifest. Um, you had the uh part where he gave the or what's his name hans yes hans mm -hmm. gave the jew bread and ended up having to send max away and you had um ruby's father leaving and and uh hans himself leaving so it's kind of where everything started to go wrong and that's kind of to me where the book was trying to trick you is it felt like everything was going wrong and then you had the the resolution with Hans coming back. I knew the book was about to end, <laughs> but it was really like, yeah, it was almost lulling you because the final part was not, the actual bombing was not even truly hinted at the extent of it until like only maybe so like, like the beginning of part 10. Yeah, the beginning of part 10. So the, the, the intro of like the very end of everything, which I thought was an interesting choice. And I'm not sure I've ever seen a story do this, but it was so abjectly horrible so like irredeemably gone that that the only way to um let you process it was to give it to you all at once and then say anyway just be ready for that then go back to the story and then slowly work your way back up to that point again um it because honestly for me i had forgotten about uh, Liesl's parents being dead, her her foster parents. Uh, by the time I had worked my way back up to near the ending, I had forgotten the, that the uh, that death just straight up told me that happened, because it happened so abruptly and then jumped back and past into the past so quickly that mm -hmm. I couldn't really keep up with that mentally. And so once it dawned on me that, oh, no, that's where this is all going, I forgot about that. I was starting to get kind of... You mean from the beginning of Part 10 to the end of it? Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I haven't really seen that used before either, that idea of teasing the ending like that so blatantly. Like, he wasn't really even hiding anything about the ending. There was no plot twist to save until the end. He just threw the plot twist in there randomly. Yeah. It... It's because I don't think that I don't think that the author I don't think that death wants it to be seen as a plot twist. I think he just wants it to be seen as what happened. Um, and of course, it is a plot, and of course, it is a plot twist in the most technical of terms. But the like he said, the point is not to be shocked in that one moment. The point is to experience what that one moment was. It's not about the surprise. Right. I think this whole book isn't really. <sighs> As much as it was a surprise, I, I agree with you that this book isn't one to uh, rely on surprises and shock factor as what makes it memorable. I found that I often would underestimate it and often would overestimate it, but rarely did I just estimate it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, feel like I've heard that somewhere before. I'm not sure. Where. <laughs> I'm not sure where. Um, oh, yeah. Well, humans haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> okay, then. Throughout the entire story, I remember thinking, I mean, especially coming up towards the end, um, because I knew that the podcast was coming in a few minutes, basically, once I finished the book. And yep, I'm thinking to myself kind of how I'm going to talk about it, what's going to happen. And up until that last section, I'm just convincing myself and going, wow, nothing really extraordinary happened in this book. It literally is just a slice of life that happens to be set in Nazi Germany. Um, and I thought that that was really cool. And then the end happened and I was shocked in the same way that Stephen was. Um, however, I didn't forget about it as I continued reading through 10. Yeah, it was neither. always on my mind. Um, plus, it probably helps that I was reading it physically rather than listening to it. So it's it's a little bit harder to just kind of fall into the words that way because you're still a little bit separated from it. Um, but as I was reading it and I, I came to the end and I'm crying my eyes out because I'm feeling the loss of you know, every person as she says goodbye to them. Um, and I'm, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I was still thinking to myself, nope, this is, this is still a slice of life. If I had to put it in a genre, it's still a slice of life. This is just what her life was. That's what it was like. And I agree with the idea. It's not that the bomb was meant to shock anyone, but I think the delivery that the author gave, or rather the delivery that death gave when telling us about it, um, was surprisingly similar to the delivery of the bomb itself. Because no one expected it. The warning bells came too late. Um, it just happened, and then everything was over. And that's exactly how the ending was. Yeah, I agree with you. It it did a good job of not just being, you know, a telegraphed um, climax that everything was building up to. Like... Most people didn't weren't at a particular point in their arc where everything had to end. They were just continuing on their lives kind of had, as they had been through the entire book. Like mm -hmm. it was three months after um, Hans had returned home. It wasn't like the night after or something climactic. Yeah. Uh, most people were just in some random uh, random point of their lives and in a random point of their lives in relation to Liesl. Um So it, that's yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was I was going to say that. I think that's why it it affected me so much because it seemed like all of these people some of them annoying some of them i've grown to like over the years were just in the middle of living and then all of a sudden everything was over 100 percent over for them it was mm -hmm. over for that town like that right. town was just gone and it, everyone at once it isn't like you get in most stories where first luke skywalker has to say goodbye to his his uncle and his aunt and then near the end of the movie he has to say goodbye to Obi-Wan Kenobi, and then in then episode five, he has to say, well, I guess Han's gone, and then in episode six, he says goodbye to his father at the very end, and this was just like, all right, let's walk from corpse to corpse and say goodbye to all of them at the same time. It's not fair. It's not very neat or very um, thematic, thematic or, or well-structured. It just happened. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think I've seen another. I can't recall seeing uh, reading another instance where just like the entire I can cast of characters is carpet bombed. What? It wasn't quite the same scenario, but do you remember that the fantasy series that ended with? Oh, wait, I'm going to spoil this whole fantasy series. <laughs> can I do that? It's very if you don't say the series. <laughs> all right, I won't. I don't say think it. anyone's going to be able to guess. It is a fantasy series that is relatively unknown, and and near the end, all of the characters started dying off one by one. Um, until pretty much everyone was dead in the most horrible ways. Um, but the theme of that that entire series was re redemption, kind of like a, um, a metaphor for, for heaven. And in the end, once the great evil was defeated, everyone came back to life. And it didn't feel cheap because that was its theme. But since, Well, yeah, they were actually like basically living in the afterlife, which is right. like the afterlife in the same earth they already were in. But in this, the theme is not heaven the theme is death so right this is highly appropriate so in that sense it was fairly uh thematic this of course is going to be a tale that death is interested in mm -hmm. someone who is the last survivor among so much death i did like um how in that last the very last section he seemed to answer the questions that we were asking the entire time um one was you know why is he so interested in the book thief why does he care right but the other one i remember us asking yep. how he knew Yep, all I of the detail. <laughs> and in one sentence, I, I actually thought of you when I read it. In one sentence, he described how he knew all of the detail. And that was when he looked into Rudy's soul. 
and could see every uh, moment of his wait, life. Rudy's or yeah, Diesel's? I think it was Rudy's. Okay, I he thought it was. Up, well, it, that's the way that I saw it. He picked up Rudy's soul and he looked inside of it, and he was, you know, because he said he handled it with care, and he mm-hmm. he made you know special special arrangements for that one. But as he looked inside of it, he could see every moment that the book thief had previously, you know, described in her book, but he was able to actually see it. And so in my head, I'm going, wow, that makes sense. So many people died during this time. No wonder he knows everything that's going on. Yeah. And if you can also, you know, see the past of the people who died, that explains how he knows what happened to Hans when Mm -hmm. he was off on his own and pretty much everyone he talked about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I thought it was interesting that they even addressed that. I thought they would just kind of leave that as a blank because, you know, so much of Death's mm-hmm. character in that is unexplained and kind of unexplainable. But it was kind of cool how they put that in at the end without drawing attention to it. It kind of made me feel really satisfied just because he kind of mm-hmm. let me into his his view a little bit and proved to me that he was not an unreliable narrator who was making all of this up. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he was. <gasps> he just made that part up too. I feel crushed. Yeah. Yep, I ruined it all. Uh, so any other notes on this ending? I'm kind of, you know, it's hard to know where to begin or where to end with this. There was a, like, what do you think? Do you think it was cheap? Do you think it was well told, the idea of killing off so many characters and then trying to bring an emotional resonance to that? Like, do you think he pulled that off? Because that's a pretty heavy, um, heavy play to make, especially at, like the very end of a book. I think he did. And I think the reason he pulled it off was because he, all he did for the entirety of the book was just introduce us to people. It's really all he did. And he showed mm-hmm. us their lives and we became their friends, some more than others. And that's how our lives are. And when you lose someone like that in your life, whether they were close to you or not close to you, or, you know, you're going to feel differently about each person. But especially when you lose someone unexpectedly, it just kind of slaps you in the face. And so as I was reading, the end of his book to me it all seemed very realistic that is something that would have likely happened um you know during that time it's not like he pulled a punch they had been having raids through the entire book so it makes sense that a bomb would eventually fall we just thought that they would know about it first um right and so and especially the feeling that i got as as um as liesel was walking through the town and basically discovering that everyone was dead it felt exactly the way that it would have had I actually lost that person um or almost Mm -hmm. it's like it was on a lower scale because Mm -hmm. I didn't actually know them but it to me it seemed very realistic and well I I think that I have never had to lose an actual person like that Mm -hmm. but I did have to lose a cat like that Mm -hmm. and it's a much smaller version of course but it is the similar feeling of finding something you care about just on the road and then mm-hmm. it isn't moving anymore. And the things you're saying to yourself are really obvious, but they're the only things you really want to say because it, you're just trying to let it sink in. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I think that was all very well told from Liesel's perspective where it isn't necessarily a freak out. She doesn't have a speech to say in her head. It's just these small little fragments that she keeps remembering or keeps repeating well the book did a really good job if you see it as you know building up to this ending um of making everyone characters not just because of their arcs in the story and their broader um and their broader roles but the little things about them be it how hans would roll a cigarette or how rosa would speak and all of those little details are what she Mm -hmm. remembered which is often you know what you'll remember about people when they move on you don't just think about oh that person was my mentor you think about just all the little everyday normal things you would know about that person all the things that you would expect to happen but now aren't going to happen exactly like the accordion for hans Mm -hmm. um so the whole book did a very good job of building up a a very plain very ordinary like it suddenly it brings importance to all the things you thought were unimportant before if that makes sense like mm-hmm. the 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 book had been doing so many small fragments and it's like why are these important this is kind of just a slice of life and then when you realize that it's in a way using those fragments to drive home the reality of it all being gone um it makes more sense what he was building towards so i think that really the the ending kind of um the ending made the tale in many ways pretty much it's 
everything kind of made sense at the end. Then, like, even during those kind of boring moments, I'm not saying they couldn't have been um, written better at some points, but they mattered at the end. Mm -hmm. The Um, plot was not just the plot of hiding Max. That was just something else that happened to her in her life. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just another person that came and went. That was something that I really actually respected from the author because that was probably the most exciting part of the book to me um, was when they were hiding Max and then he's like, okay, you know, he's gone. Um, It's kind of like someone who's not afraid to kill a character or not afraid to just drastically change something that's going so well for him. Um, Mm -hmm. And that was, I don't know, it just made it better to me that Max had to leave and that all these things happened because it's like, oh, you know what? This girl's life entirety of her life was not hiding a Jew just as the entirety of her life was not living on um, Himmel Street you know right it was just a very small portion of her life that we happened to get to see and then she moved on and yeah. I, I I really appreciated the fact that we we understood what she went on to do she you know she got married she lived to a much older age but we we don't follow that we don't really know any of the details to mm-hmm. us that doesn't right. really matter the story ended with Himmel Street um but, That's interesting. Himmel Street was almost like the primary character that book is building the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And it's interesting to me because the idea of, you know, an adolescent person losing their hometown and then moving on with their life after that is, you know, done in 90% of heroes journeys. Uh, and it's not very affecting typically when the homestead burns in Star Wars mm-hmm. or when um, the Shire didn't get burned. But there are a lot of other similar examples in fantasy and and um, and heroes journey. So that sort of thing happening of, you know, the home village getting attacked and people getting kidnapped and people yeah. getting killed and things burning and now you have to go save the day. This is like a whole book around that concept of losing mm-hmm. your home, but it did it in s- such a more realistic, stark, and affecting way because it actually... It wasn't just a token. It wasn't just a thing to do to push the character forward into something else. It was the story, was the idea of all of this being gone suddenly. That's something I love about it. If if you had been that character, to you, that would have been the story, whereas everyone else would have looked at what you did after that and what you went on to do. And it talked briefly about how she touched so many different people's lives. And Mm -hmm. it's tempting to tell that story and saying, this is why, this is the foundation. Who cares about the backstory? Exactly. Without the full book you wouldn't have even understood that foundation and it wouldn't have affected you. You wouldn't have cared. Exactly. Um, and so I, since, I thought that was, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, well, you can finish your thoughts. I don't write. Oh, I was just thinking another example of that was the uh, backstory. We often malign on uh, we've done on this podcast, at least for, <laughs> um, I forget the name of it. Name of the wind. Is that it? Steven? Oh yeah. 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 Like, that's what he was trying to do as well, but books never truly give it enough time or enough care. You kind of just yeah. know what's coming. Mm-hmm. It's, it always it. feels like act one chapter one right um this is this is what makes this person like this later on mm-hmm. but this isn't what made lisa lisa later on this was lisa in that moment and, and if anything oh, yeah, this this story truly values the the present moment which is something as I've, as I've grown older i've realized how important it is to just be present in whatever moment you you're in right now Mm -hmm. and i feel like this book profoundly understands that that's a good point i I have nothing to add to that (laughs) (laughs) um i had something to add to it earlier or or rather a similar point i think another reason it was so affecting was when it went through what everyone is doing when the bomb actually fell yeah that was and not in a and this is what he was doing when he died kind of thing. It's like not that, in an ironic way. Yeah, it's just, again, the little moments, the little, the small touches. I almost um, felt like that section in which he was talking about the bomb falling was a slice of life within a slice of life. It's mm-hmm. like everything paused and I didn't see anyone moving at all. I saw everything still as if it was um, like, you know, paused and you're just walking through the town. It's kind of how I saw that. No one no one moved, no one mm-hmm. blinked, no one did anything, um, and then the bomb fell. I think it would be really interesting if that's how they end up having shot it in the movie. Yeah. I'd be curious how they do that. Um, and because yeah. death, death was telling this whole story, I mean, for starters, that's kind of how Death sees the world. He's always talking about walking between souls and, you know, he has mm-hmm. an eternity in every moment. Um, but because his whole thing is death, but Himmel Street was you know, a pretty calm place. I bet it was really calm before the war. 
um, he didn't really have much to do. He spent a lot of time in this story telling us about what everyone else was up to. But then at that, and he was always saying, oh, being, being death itself is a difficult job and the war made it 10 times as difficult. And it was, and to me in that last scene, you really got that sensation where you were there with him walking from soul to soul to soul, leaving all of these bodies behind. And not only is it just interesting to see death personified like that, but, you know, you move past that into the more metaf metaphorical part, not just thinking of him as a character, but seeing how weary it is to deal with death on a large scale, how every death is taxes everything and everyone around it. But a whole bomb wiping out a whole town is just utterly exhausting. It's almost it's almost too difficult to count all of the ways it's affecting the world. And, you know, right. death just seemed depressed there near the end. You'd think that death has always been like, I have the, the great the great power to take souls and point at you with my bony fingers. And I admit this is great fun, but it's just such such the opposite. Yeah, I remember that's... him mentioning um, in chapters previous, I think it was in part two that he mentioned that the he he didn't particularly like his job. Yeah, um, and <laughs> and that was just so interesting to me to think about. And it's like, oh, he's he's death, but he doesn't like it when people die. Okay. And um, we did get to see that uh, he can apparently interact with the dead to some level, mm -hmm. which we were wondering about before. I think he just chose not to interact with a lot of them. Yeah. Um, because it, I think it's probably the same thing he'd mentioned in the beginning he's like you know i don't stop and watch things i don't find out what happens to the rest of their lives i, I pick them up and i leave um and i feel like interacting with the dead would be the basically the same thing as stopping and watching the living um so it's it's fits that the only person that we really see him interact with a lot is liesel um he does interact with a couple of other people um or at least briefly or at least i got the hint that he did <laughs> But mm -hmm. it was interesting that she was she's basically the only one that we actually know of that he has stopped and interacted with. Right. Something I'm wondering is very early in the book when he's saying the three times he had met with Liesl, um, one of those times, the third one was amongst a bomb ruined town. Mm -hmm. um, and I think two reasons that that didn't, you know, entirely telegraph what was going to happen for me is one because I read it over so many weeks for this podcast, yeah. that was not fresh in my mind. It's surely not as fresh as it would have been probably for most people reading this book. Um, and secondly, I I felt like that is how Rudy was going to die, but not everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if he partially started giving that um, warning as something of a red herring. Um, that, you know, oh, oh, that third moment is going to be when Rudy dies because he keeps talking about how he's mm -hmm. going to die, but he doesn't keep talking about how anyone else is going to die. Mm -hmm. So you assume that, like, everyone's going to be safe in the basement except for Rudy for whatever reason. Because, um, like, why was he so intent that Rudy was going to die but never mentioned it for Hans and never mentioned it for Rosa? I mean, I have to imagine that was to play around the idea that he gave you that glimpse at the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a really, um, I don't know, surprisingly effective um tactic to use because death was so enthralled with rudy like way more than i was like i yeah. liked rudy but mm -hmm. death is just like oh that kid he just gets into my head rudy's oh man he died guys <laughs> <laughs> yeah death it's a bummer but so did everyone else <laughs> I, yeah I, I'm, it's interesting that death can choose favorites and do you want to be death's favorite i i don't know i guess so <laughs> Yeah, I have a feeling. I have a feeling the reason Rudy was his favorite was mostly because of that one time that he'd seen him before, um, when the the English pilot crashed. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And I I remember seeing that, um, and it was just kind of it was it was odd to me. But but obviously Rudy stuck out, and he's like, you know what? That's a kid who's kind of awesome, and I would like him to live. And then like a month later, however long he ends up dying. Yeah, death death doesn't seem to have a very happy existence. No. He's a good writer, though. He should, he should keep that this. <laughs> he has an interesting <laughs> perspective, for sure. I've never read a book by death. Yeah, uh, though, okay, so weird aside, in this world, is death publishing this book somehow? No, I think he's just telling the story. Because he keeps saying, like, you, 
like he'll refer to the reader as a person, but I wonder if he's just doing I that, think you know? that you, the reader, are dead. And oh. you're just sitting around in Deadland and death is sitting across from you drinking coffee and telling you this story. Interesting. That's one way to look at it. Hmm. I right. always I always like got it. the feeling that he was telling the story in short bursts in between being very busy. <laughs> That's like awesome. Really <laughs> That's how I listen to the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly because he, he comes back to that and he's just like, oh, and I had to go do this and then I had to do that. And it just made me like, it gave me the sense that he can sit down for two seconds, but as soon as he sits down, oh, dang it, someone else died. Gotta right. go pick them so, up now. Yeah, all right. And that's why the scenes are always so short. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, move on to the next thing. Um, so, uh, apart from just, you know, the, the ending wherein everyone is dead, what did you think about how this act tied together everything else? Um, was there anything else you still felt needed um, elaboration? I know we had a few problems, like, with Rudy and some of the other characters at the end of Act 2. Um, do you feel like this act uh, brought a lot to the rest of the story? I feel um, like it did. I mean, I don't want to keep on harping on the just the ending ending. Okay. But because the purpose was to cut off these lives before they were done, mm -hmm. um, I think that does rectify a lot of my problems with it before. Like Rudy, for example, he always seemed like on the verge of kind of changing or becoming a different character or, you know, moving on in a Xander story arc or something mm -hmm. from Buffy. Uh, but he kind of didn't have time. Like, right. he he changed. He certainly grew older, and he and Liesl grew closer, and it seemed like they were ready to go on some adventures together, but that just didn't happen. Um, I did like that he kind of telegraphed the man that Rudy would have become, mm -hmm. and you got to see some a few little moments that in would have impacted the rest of his life, and you're like, yes, that would have made him such a great person, but he just didn't get to get there. Right. Yeah, I, I was liking pretty much all of the characters a lot more by the end of Act 3. Mm -hmm. uh, I think maybe because they are bringing more weight to them and more stuff is happening. Mm -hmm. um, it is funny, Abigail is pretty... Um, I was also like you, where before the ending of everything, I'm like, you know, this is pretty good, but I guess this book doesn't really have a point because it's just so <laughs> near the end. I'm yeah. like, how much can they really do at this point? Um, apparently, you know kill everybody is, is a legitimate option <laughs> i don't recommend it for option. most stories you know if it's i like to imagine that he was just bored at that point and realized he had like half a book more to write so he's just like i'll just drop a bomb on everyone i'll <laughs> i'll fix it in the second draft <laughs> i kind of wonder how he how he did decide on that was the mm -hmm. original concept i'm going to tell a story narrated by death which ends with everyone dying was like that was that the pitch to himself See, what's um, funny is that's the most logical conclusion. When you find out that a story is narrated by death, how could we not see that everyone was going to die? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how we didn't pick up on that because it just makes so much sense. Yeah, I mean, it's possible it's super obvious and the intent is to be super obvious. I and mean, he opened it with her town was mm -hmm. bombed. All right, yeah. let's talk about her town now. But I still didn't assume everyone would actually die in the bombing. I mean, yeah. It's just my interpretation it just, of it. It maybe really makes of how you realize you how bad bombs are. <laughs> I mean, it's like you you logically knew that mm -hmm. and if someone to sit down and tell you it kills a lot of people you'd be like okay i know i know that it does that but i think it's that perspective of seeing all these lives that you had been you know busy keeping track of being over that's it move on immediately you realize oh man that's just such a small version of all the other things that happen when you bomb cities and civilian towns um, and then, and so many, you know, World War II books, that's a, like a footnote or something. Um, I mean, I'm sure the point had been made before, but nevertheless, it was effective. Yeah. Or they talk about, you know, going in shelters while things are being bombed or losing specific people. But the idea of the entire book building up a single town and mm -hmm. then demolishing it all in a few sentences is, is definitely an interesting tact to take. Mm -hmm. um, I also thought it was interesting that, again, this book loves to play with expectations and narrative flow that before any of that happened, they just randomly or seemingly randomly tossed in like one of the most tragic parts with the suicide, mm -hmm. which had no real connection with the actual tragedy that came afterwards. But it's just like, what an odd way to, to orchestrate the tone of your book, because it would have been so easy to make it. Everything's going right. Everything's going right. Pull a weed in and then ruin everything. Um, but he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Like he didn't just make 
make it seem like everything is going wrong and then seem like everything is fixed and then destroy everything. He kept up with the tragic elements throughout the build up to the end. Absolutely. That's something that I did notice about the third act. Um, I tend to harp on the third acts of books because the third act is always a completely different story than the rest of the book in my the way that I see it. This mm-hmm. one, although it tied in very, very well, it tied in super well, it was much it was definitely the the decline, I suppose. Whereas yeah. most books are building up and building up and building up until they get the climax. I feel like this one was building up until it hit Act 3 and then just went downhill all the way down. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was interesting that good things were happening, like Hans came back, but it's also the act that Hans went away. It's also the act mm-hmm. that Max went away that max went to the concentration camp that rudy's dad went away that you know michael came back yay but then he committed suicide he went away um and it was interesting that there were still good moments and again it's just showing exactly what life looks like even in the midst of terrible times because i've been through a ton of terrible times even in the midst of something that you think is so horrible there's still that bright spot you'll still have a good day you'll still be happy about something or laugh at a joke even though all this terrible stuff is happening around you. Yeah. I think that was also a really effective thing he did was immediately after you saw her abjectly, you know, uh, surrounded by pretty much the most impossible loss you can imagine for someone, especially at that age, he then just jumped ahead and showed she had a perfectly fulfilled normal life after that. Mm -hmm. Um, And just suddenly seeing that instead of slowly building up to that was an interesting way of telling that sort of story too. There was a lot of story told in the fact that she went on to have her own family and live what appeared to be from how she ended up accepting her death a fulfilled life that she that she was happy with Mm -hmm. um and seeing that kind of time sped up it's another example of how he plays around with typical narrative flow yeah i feel Mm -hmm. like if you ever try to predict this book it doesn't necessarily admonish you for predicting it it just kind of tells you it's going to happen it says please stop focusing on that yeah exactly stop being obsessed with that Every don't time. try to guess what the plot twist is or what the structure is. I'm just telling a story here in ways that I that stories are kind of meant to be told. And mm-hmm. I think the reason it surprises us so much is so many stories follow formulas now. Mm-hmm. Like that, the the decline you were talking about, Abigail, was like it, it definitely it had a definite downwards curve. Like it it two thirds of that book, nothing really bad happened. That was some of our biggest problems. So it certainly had that you know that steep slope. But it w- it wasn't smooth. It was like a right. like a this sort of messy, drunken line that death was slowly trotting through to to eventually slam down with that bomb. Mm-hmm. Um, it just things would get sharply worse, and then a little bit better, and then a few jokes here, and then there'd be a death, or there'd be a suicide, or there, and then they'd crawl back up. But it would. It was too late at that point. Too much had been torn up by that war, and eventually everything was gone. I mean, honestly, all the book was focusing on the entire time was two things. Um, One was Liesl's connection to other people, and it spent a very long time on that. Mm -hmm. Um, And the second was Liesl's connection to words. Um, Yeah. But it wasn't trying to tell really long, broad arcs. It was just trying to tell those two things developing. Yeah. and I think he did a really good job of that. Like everything that happened was pretty much going to be based around one of those two concepts. And even then they're typically intertwined. Like it wasn't a story about a Jew hiding. It was a story about how that Jew got to know Liesl. Um, mm-hmm. Not to some single conclusion, but just in developing that relationship was pretty much all the book was interested in doing. And um, yet all of all of the relationships from Liesl were linked towards death's perspective of her. So it was really about death. Maybe you could say the two co-stars were Lisa and Death. Right. I did feel in the third in the third act that Death was much more of a character than he'd been before. And I was like, oh, wow. This mm-hmm. this isn't even the story of the book thief. This is the story of what the Death, like how, how Death sees the book thief. Right. It wasn't even about her. I think it's interesting how Death takes a much more subjective role whenever he was present for something. Yeah. I think that's a that's a smart thing. And to how do, he to likes to imagine commander. things in specific ways. It's yeah, like he's such a sentimental uh fellow for being <laughs> dead that he He is. I always, think he has a lot of time to to think about such things. Well, he's haunted by humans. It was his final words from the story. He's obsessed right. with it. It's his 
it's his job and his curse and his duty and his pleasure, I guess. It's mm. very strange. I'm sure there are so many layers you could dig into with that. Right. And this is kind of an interesting episode because none of us were given much time to think about this ending, which if we sound like a bit off the cuff, it's because we are. We've been really busy these past few weeks. I mean, we, um, we all We literally finished just book. finished the book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So I figured I would just harp on the idea of us just going off with what our first thoughts were rather than, you know, constructing really good, um, well thought out analyses of it. Because, you know, first impressions are cool in their own right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been interesting to see how that's affected. It seems like it affected all of us pretty similarly. Um, we all had a pretty similar takeaway. Are there any, like, criticisms of the third act that you, any of you have or, or things you felt lacking? Anything I, really I felt lacking was lacking more so in the past. Um, what do you mean by that? I mean, any of the the uneven characters or the like, it, like any problem I would have with the book was used to be worse. And this is just making it better and mm -hmm. making it make more sense. Um, I really don't think I can complain. Maybe I'll change my mind in the future. But I think that it was a good, if horribly tragic decision to do that you know um final everything has ended bomb scene um for all the reasons we've talked about and simply because um it just it's really the only logical conclusion to the end of that story mm -hmm. and yet somehow against all odds it wasn't obvious i feel like that actually plays into just humanity and who we are um because i've done a lot of I guess, research into writing tragedy and into writing horror and whatnot. And so I've learned a lot about emotions and just how humans react to things. And it's been said um, before that basically there are two reactions to a horribly terrible situation. You can either laugh or scream in terror. And that one quote always comes back to haunt me because it's so true terrible things will happen and we have a choice of either ignoring it and pretending that it's not bad or just letting it consume us um sometimes you know if you're mature and you've thought about it for a while you can find that middle road where you can say yes it was terrible but i can still live which is what lisa ended up doing um but i feel like us reading through the book was very much like the first scenario we're reading through this and we're saying here's a story narrated by death it happens in nazi germany i am falling in love with all of these characters of course no one's gonna die this is gonna be great and yet everything is telegraphing the opposite just as that just 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 who humans are we just want things to end well we're not expecting something terrible to happen and then when humans are uh involved in the writing of the story we assume that they will pace it to make us sad but not too sad Mm -hmm. right like you think they're going to pull their punches you think they're going to make it a sensible normal narrative arc when reality is anything but a sensible normal narrative arc or like a story we we often talk about the fall in our stars um yeah that's a sensible sensible right normal you narrative. lose yeah. gus and that's so spoilers super for fault in our stars by the way oh sorry he had cancer <laughs> <laughs> yes but um, the point is spoiler cancer can kill people <laughs> but he didn't have cancer you didn't know he He's had cancer remission. until act three you're right i apologize for that so um please put a spoiler that's in not actually this true episode, brian all right i'll try to remember that <laughs> okay um uh so what are we spoiling? i'm gonna write that down right now <laughs> i kind of thought we already talked about fault in our stars but i guess we hadn't we never, that was, we that was off the podcast. okay yeah i'm gonna beat you if somebody hears this and then they're upset because you spoiled the book for them you're right that, that is an awful thing for me to do <laughs> wait gus dies i mean <gasps> no nothing happens it's fine okay. everyone lives and is happy Oh, Yay. that's a boring book. I'm not going to read that. <laughs> anyway. Don't read it. It's not worth it. You were making a point, Stephen. <laughs> um, yes, I was making a blunt point. Um, what was it? Oh, yeah. You, my, you were saying that my it point, doesn't have My a, point yeah. was that in, in The Fault in Our Stars, it was tragic, but it made sense. You lost something sharply, but you kept everything else. 
Um, but in this, it was just kind of everything. And yeah, you can't just kill someone's father figure and their mother figure and their romantic interest and, <laughs> and the all of their friends and all of and the random people they knew. Yeah, it's, like literally everyone she knew was in that city. It's not just you know the important characters in the book. It's every single person she grew up with. Well, she does Except, keep you know, she does keep three people, and I was very happy. Um, yeah. Honestly, with the choices, she gets to keep Max. She gets to keep, I think, Ilsa. Is that how you say her name? The, Ilsa? the is how, Ilsa, Ilsa is how something like that. Yeah. Um, and then we also keep Alex Steiner. Yeah, or you're right. Steiner, mm-hmm. if you go by. And I, I have a feeling that um, Alex and Liesel had some very interesting conversations and just a cool mm-hmm. relationship going forward that we never even got to see. Um, that yeah. would have been an interesting story in its own to figure well, out. Well, you can wait for the book thief too. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome to. Um, so when she ended up, she ended up going back to the mayor's house. Um, she stayed there for at least a little while. You never found out if she ended up staying with the mayor indefinitely or if she just stayed there for a few days. Um, mm-hmm. But it was interesting that she got to go back with the mayor's wife, and now she was in the exact same position as this woman right. that she had been basically chastising for that position and i almost feel like yeah in my head we never get to find out how that ends but just i feel like as terrible as this was it was probably a blessing for that woman because she had a a young child that she was able to care for somebody who'd been through something terrible that she herself had experienced it brought their bond to you know a new level and in my head, I'm imagining this bringing healing to her, which is right. terrible, mm-hmm. but that's just what happens. And very recently, the mayor's wife had said to Liesel, don't don't become like me. Mm-hmm. I wonder if Liesel did. We don't really know that. Well, I don't think she did because we do get to see the very end of her life. And Death talked about all the people that she touched and basically how active she was in other people's lives. And he did make that comparison of how her soul sat up. That's true. When he came it seems to get like her, she turned so out She probably strong. turned out much more like Hans than yeah. like anyone else. I like Hans. Hans was great. Good character. I agree. I disagree strongly with this. Hans was the worst character in the book. What is wrong with you people? Oh. Um, <laughs> no, I agree. Hans was a stand-up man. Or a sit-up man, I should say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, funniness. Um, before we close out our episode, I'd like to talk some about what we thought about the book as a whole and not just the ending. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, overall, what do you think of the book? Do you recommend it? Do you think it's a good book? Do you think it was missing anything I in particular? I would like to compare it to the mm. book that I had talked about a little while ago. Um, okay. I think maybe during the first episode, All the Light That We Cannot See. All right. Um, which Did is, everyone get bombed? I can't tell you how it ended. But okay. it was about, you know, a girl in um, World War II and, you know, it was that mm-hmm. whole thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it had many similarities, but was a very differently told story. And I think that the book thief had more highs and more lows than that book. I think that one third of the way through each book, I absolutely think that All the Light We Cannot See was far better. Maybe two thirds of the way they were starting to even out, but I would still, I would still give it to all the light. The by the very end of the book thief, I'm not so sure anymore. I might have, I might like the book thief even more. I think it was a, I think the book thief is really powerful and interestingly, in, insanely written in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but it did have to go through a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, middling uh, work to get there. Yeah. Um, and maybe that makes it better in the end. Maybe I'm just giving it a free pass because it was so emotionally devastating and weird at the end. I'm not right. sure. It's certainly worth reading. For me, I think the difference comes in, well, I haven't read that other book you're talking about, but what I think separates what I liked about the book thief from what I didn't like as much about the book thief is I think the concepts of the book thief and how it's told and what it's generally telling are excellent. I think having death as a narrator is fantastic. I think a lot of his narrative devices are really good. Um, if, you know, sometimes a little bit overwrought, mm-hmm. kind of realize it's part of his character. I think, again, the flow of how they tell it, how they flash forward, how they build up a small town. Oh, I just want to say one devastating thing. It. Yes. One thing. I think that death went too far when he called it a breakfast colored sky. 
Okay, that's interesting. That's just that was um, the point where I was like, no, it's what I is like that, that part, mean? but I'll continue my point. <laughs> okay. um, so all of those basic narrative uh, ideas were fantastic, um, and I think they pulled together incredibly well by the end. It's just this idea of telling a slice of life story that ends up with it all being destroyed. Um, but I don't think was as good are the particulars. Like I'm imagining how amazing this book would have been if the characters were better, mm-hmm. and there were some good characters in it. But I think the only characters that I think were were very good were maybe Liesl and Hans. And I think yeah. the rest were below average for most books. Like, not Rosa, Rudy, they're okay. But imagine if, like, really interesting, well-written characters were put into this general um, setting and this type of writing. I think it would have been way more affecting overall. and would have been, like, a truly unforgettable book instead of just a really, really good one. Hmm. Uh, I'll agree with that. I felt... So as far as how I'm going to rank this book, it's not one of my favorites. I may or may not read it again. I yeah. would I would probably recommend it to someone, but I'm not going to give it to them and say, oh my God, you have to read this book. It is amazing. Right. Um, however, that being said, I think that the way the book was written and everything that happened was exactly as it should have been. Um, because as, as I close the book and I think over the rest of the, the plot that happened and everything that I went through to get there, I'm just piecing it together in my mind and going, yep, that's that's exactly what he intended, intended to get across. And I got out of it exactly what the author wanted me to get out of it. I asked the questions that the author wanted me to ask, and I've reaped the benefits mm-hmm. that I was supposed to going into this book, even though yeah. going into it, I didn't know that those were the benefits I was supposed to reap. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. In terms of how he structured it and how it led from one thing to the to the other was especially i think my point from last week where for because what i heard of people saying about the book and how i felt the book was marketing itself i assumed it was going to be darker mm-hmm. and i assumed it was that's like be exactly what i should have been thought mm-hmm. at that point yeah right I, I assumed it was going to be some thriller about this like girl on the yeah. streets who you know doesn't have a family and she's stealing things with her best friend rudy or whatever right um that's totally not what i got <laughs> exactly i just think the fact that, at least for me, that I was kind of bored during so much of the Slice of Life stuff, I can only mm-hmm. imagine how book good the book would have been if I was so enthralled just in the randomness of the things that were going on and so interested in it mm-hmm. that I kind of forgot that there needed to be a broader narrative. Well, because arc. I don't want anyone to think that I, I don't like Slice of Life style narratives. I mean... That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. Like, Yeah, like... In, I, I love role-playing and creating characters in World of Warcraft, and that's, like, all that is. Well, for example, Stephen, remember Tales of Vesperia, a Japanese RPG we played a while back? Mm-hmm. We were so delighted with that game because it didn't seem to have a major plot. And so yeah. it was just a lot of different really good conversations and really strong characters doing seemingly random things. They attempted to pull us all together at the end and actually did a really poor job of it, but if the book thief had had that concept of, man, this book isn't doing anything particular— but I have no problem with that because right. it's so interesting and these events are so fun mm-hmm. and and moving to see in of themselves. And then they pulled out the rug from under you. I think it would have been an unforgettable. Like inst- of instead of it, instead of it feeling like, where's death? I'm waiting for death to come back. Yeah. You kind mm-hmm. of think, oh, I, f- I forgot about death. I got so wrapped up in these adventures. And you kind of adventures. dread him coming back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You didn't know and that I, I felt like that somehow. at parts. There were, mm-hmm. I feel like the whole book was a collection of smaller stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there were some stories that were more interesting than others. And there were some stories that I was reading and going, I can't wait till this part is over. Agreed. But I, I, st- I don't know. Yeah. I still liked it for sure. It wasn't as good as at Anne of Green Gables or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like the ultimate slice of life story that I compare yeah. everything to. Right. If you could combine <laughs> like the writing and engagement of that with the narrative arc of this, mm-hmm. that would be super interesting. That would have been heartbreaking. I'm just going to write a new edit of Anne of Green Gables where I kill everyone. At the end. <laughs> oh, don't do it. <laughs> Anne of Green Gables. Oh, wait, I had to put in my spoilers. Okay. Spoilers for Anne of Green Gables. Um, instead went for the route of killing that one person, the equivalent if they had just killed Hans and affected you with that. Um, which I thought was interesting, and a very moving death that I still remember. So I give it, I give it three and a half books out of books. <laughs> <laughs> out of all the books ever, <laughs> three, yep, three and a half. Are books you just not going to explain that? That's my scoring system. All right, three and a half books out of books. <laughs> um, Abigail, what what uh, apparent score do you give it? Oh man, metric here. I probably give it a. 
I'd have to read it again, I feel. But for yeah. now, it's a 3.75 out of 5. Um, it's, yeah. it, it may go up to a 4 with a second read. Um, mm-hmm. It's never going to be a 5 in my mind. Mm-hmm. But it it wasn't a waste of my time. Yeah, I was glad that I read it. It's I think that's the thing. Favorite. Even when it was kind of boring or, or, or difficult to get through. And by by the third, the, the, the third, third, the third, third of the book. <laughs> um, I wasn't really feeling that anyway. Um, yeah. Regardless, it's worth yeah. reading. It's worth putting yeah, the time absolutely. in for it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's yeah. not very long. It's really easy to get through. And I, had mm-hmm. I not been doing this podcast, I would have finished it in a couple of days. And I probably would have liked it a little bit more because I would have consumed it all at once and then just been struck by the ending. So it's definitely a really good book. And that's why I think on a second read through, its score would improve. Um, but yeah, it's not definitely not a waste of your time. Agreed. I am going to go ahead and give it a 3.76 because I was perfectly fine with Breakfast Colored Sky. I was. <laughs> I actually liked that. <laughs> yeah, me too. I, All right. I, I understand why I should like it, but for whatever reason, that one That's just, what just kind of went What right got to me, me throughout it is how he overused the idea of describing words as physical objects. Like, that was really... You know, kind of, oh, that's a cool turn of phrase at first, but he just used it so mm-hmm. many times. Uh, the word bounced back and lay limply on the floor at her feet was like used so many times that it kind of started to feel repetitive instead of interesting. It right. almost did that for me, but it kind of crossed over into this is just how death thinks. Yes, yeah. mm-hmm. exactly. Um, mm-hmm. So that's cool. Besides, I really, really, really like thinking that way. And words are a, you know, kind of a theme of the book. Yeah. So making them physical makes sense. Absolutely. I did like how even more than just words, just with any non-physical object, it became a physical object. And mm-hmm. to me, that makes sense because death is a non-physical object who right. is also a physical object. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so it's, it makes perfect sense that he locations. would see the world that way. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. when I gave the Fault in Our Stars spoiler earlier, was that the <sighs> equ- equivalent of me taking my word glove off and slapping the listener upside the head with it? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We're going to say that. We're going to go with that. Uh, yeah. So any closing thoughts on The Book Thief before we, we end this series and move on to our next book? Great now choice, Abigail. Yeah, thanks. Now that we've spoiled it, you should go out and read it. <laughs> I hope most people have read it already. <laughs> yeah, otherwise our, our conversation is going to be very confusing and shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I know for a fact that my sister's listening to this podcast and has not read the book. Oh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> halt. Fortunately. I, I, I am wondering about her judgment. Why is she bothering wasting her time? <laughs> she has read The Fault in Our Stars. and that's Oh, oh good. Thank has you. she read Anne of Green Gables? Um, she's seen the movies. Okay, close enough. She'll know the spoiler then. <laughs> um, <laughs> the spoiler of how the bomb gets dropped on everyone in Anne <laughs> The entirety exactly. of the island. And she's just, and she doesn't even notice because she's worried about her hair being green at the moment. So. <laughs> All right. For everyone's benefit, my sister does not have green hair <laughs> anymore. <laughs> well, okay. That's an interesting uh, factoid. And I don't uh, yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, Stephen. I always knew you'd go green. <laughs> um, all right. So, as for future plans, what what book are we doing next, Stephen? Didn't you have something in the in in the wings? Uh, I I did. Um, and I don't really know much about this book at all, and that's kind of how I how I like it. I want to be surprised too. Um, it's called The Golem and the Genie. Um, and it's written by Helen Wecker, I think. Okay. Um, I and I have known about this book for a while. It just kind of caught my eye, so I put it on my wish list on Audible. I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is a story about mythical creatures, mm-hmm. specifically a golem and a genie, mm-hmm. and how they interact in the world. Um, and apparently, it's a bit magical, uh, a bit moving, and people love it. Okay, people love it is a pretty good recommendation. Mm-hmm. Um, so is this like, can you buy it on Amazon? You can buy it on Amazon. You can buy it on Audible. I okay. assume that there's, That's a, all I care there's about. a Kindle version or whatever, <laughs> oh, sure. whatever. It's super available. Um, so Amazon, Kindle Amazon, or Amazon, Amazon is basically what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> or your library? Amazon owns books now. I don't it know. Really you does. actually have to pay them a royalty every time you turn a page. Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> Uh, well, no, that sounds really neat, though. So I need to start reading that. So anyone familiar with our format, that is going to be two weeks from now is going to be the first act for that book. As for next week's episode, that is going to be another bookmark episode, but we're going to do something special this week. 
in celebration of finishing the book thief the book we are going to discuss the book thief the movie which came out in 2013 i can't and imagine this movie being done well enough lots of people love it uh people love it what was the recommendation <laughs> I, how are they gonna do death uh, I'm wondering, I, hear, I yeah. often wonder if he's even, I, I almost feel like it shouldn't even be told by his perspective, because I don't well, know how they is. can even do that. Then you're it, just stuck apparently. with a boring movie. <laughs> 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 I can see them doing it, just have a voiceover narrator who is deaf. And he just <laughs> says things like, I picked up the soul, and we just kind of see images of the body lying there and stuff. You could, yeah. Well, I, there are I'm ways really to do it. I can't Harder cinematic feats have been done. Steven. Yeah, I am glad that it didn't come out until 2013 because 2013 was a pretty good year as far as technology. Exactly. Exactly. I think I think it'll be okay. I think it'll at least be okay. Cool. And if it's not, that might even make for a better discussion. I guess that's a good point. Uh, so yeah, someday, you can us... pick that movie up on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> surprise! Surprise! And also, you can get the disc in from Netflix, and there are other places to get it. So, we're if anyone it. actually still gets discs from Netflix, that's that's what we're. I know using. some people who do. Surprisingly, oh, wow. I know. Well, could you ask them to tell us how it is by uh, sending us a letter through the <laughs> U.S. Postal <laughs> Service? <laughs> Please leave us a five star review on iTunes by sending us a letter with your review, and we'll post it for you. <laughs> Please give um, us five just books. Give us out your of account books. name and your login password. We'll <laughs> be happy to do that on Mail your Mail us your login password. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's okay. perfectly secure. We promise. <laughs> All right, uh, and that'll do it for this episode. Thank you, Stephen. You're welcome. Thank you, Abigail. My pleasure. Thank you, Death, if you're listening. We appreciated <laughs> it. Um, <sighs> outro stuff. If you want to... <laughs> I'm so excited about this, you can tell. Uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, we are Third Person Show. If you want to email us something, we are Third Person Show at gmail.com. On YouTube, you just look up Third Person Storytelling Podcast, and we have um we have our show up there on YouTube. If you are using YouTube but are currently listening to it on something else but would prefer to use YouTube, <laughs> then go ahead and uh, look us up. Um, if you'd like to stare at a static image as you watch the, a low the bit rate bar static bar. image at that, <laughs> yeah, as you watch a little bar. See, I don't the know. Good thing about the YouTube, y'all, I, I, iPhone users. Psh, what we do is we pull up YouTube on our phone and we stick our phone in our pocket. So it's pretty much like listening to it. Um, the only thing is it's really hard to get iTunes podcasts on other uh, players. But if you do want to get our podcast on a player and are not an iPhone user, Podcast Republic does have it. So get that one because it's pretty good. Yeah, but I mean, the quality of people we're going to get if they're using Android probably aren't yeah. worth having. Wow, well, I'm anyway. leaving right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, and yeah, that'll do it for all our stuff. Uh, personal Twitter, if you want to follow us as as human beings and actually care about who we are, um, I'm Lord Melder on Twitter. Steven is Stephen Kelly 180 and Abigail, Abigail is Android user 76. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I changed my Twitter handle. <laughs> uh, what is it again? I, I always do it wrong. I am the thinky reader. All right, and that'll that'll do it, um, Stephen. Uh, yeah, this is. I'm feeling kind of somber after all of this, so I think I'm gonna go eat a veggie burger and watch Gilmore Girls. Yeah, I think okay. I'm gonna go eat cookie dough and watch Gilmore Girls. Oh uh, man, the, the, these are equally good <laughs> solutions <laughs> to our problem. Actually, just kidding. I'm not gonna watch Gilmore Girls, but I probably will read Brody's Ghost, which is just I don't as even good know as what that is. It's a graphic novel, which is almost like watching a movie. Oh, yeah. cool. Well, I hope yeah. you enjoy that. Yeah. Uh, but actually, Stephen, the reason I was saying your name is I want you to come up with our sign-off for this oh, week. Because okay. you did so well last week. Um, all right. I, all right. Um, it's going to be... Ah, time's up. Abigail, you can come up with it this week. <laughs> um, shoot. All I can think of is hug a book. Hug a book. <laughs> <laughs> I love that this is actually going to become our sign-off. All right, everyone. Go hug a book. <laughs>